So the goal of my uh, research team is to push forward fundamental NLP technologies. So most of the students, they work on fundamental NLP problems, such as parsing and also information extraction problems to extract structured information from unstructured text to make algorithms intelligent in understanding human languages, in generating human languages across domains. What's more fundamental, we're trying to train algorithms that can learn and that can generalize from a more uh, a cognitive point of view. A real NLP system is an NLP system that can really understand what you say. Even though someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful Westlake University in Hangzhou, China. We are now going to be talking about Natural Language Processing, NLP. We have Dr. Yue Zhong joining us on the show. Hi, Yue. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my honor. It's such a pleasure for us as well. Thank you. For those that don't know Yue's background, he's an associate professor in PI at Westlake University focused on machine learning based natural language processing, web information extraction, and financial market prediction. In NLP, he works on fundamental problems such as parsing and generation, in particular for English and Chinese. And you can find his links in the bio below. All right, Yue, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Um, I mean, this is a complex question. I think we're moving very uh, technological and the trend will not stop. I think we'll grow more and more technological. But in terms of whether this is a correct direction, uh, it's debatable, I think. I mean, this, this might be a philosophical question, but uh, which we can discuss a little bit later. We've had so many conversations on our show about the direction of our world advancing technologically and calling it a wisdom race that as the exponential technologies become democratized, that the power of causing malevolence becomes democratized, catastrophic malevolence and our wisdom has to increase our consciousness has to rise up fast our awareness must rise up fast and that awakening process uh, can be catalyzed also through technology and so it's this process of being able to figure out hmm, how do we awaken fast enough to be able to deal with the godlike power that we're unlocking yeah, I'm a big, big fan of that one. What would you say is a key, maybe skill or essential that we can embody to make sure that we win that wisdom race? Um, uh, first of all, um, I don't completely um, um, uh, agree that uh, we're, we're necessarily in that wisdom race. But in terms of um, uh, we need to be more technological in order to survive in the current society, and this is true. Um, there are a lot of interesting things to discover, um, and there are a lot of um, um, changes that we need to adapt to. Um, I think, well, uh, in order to better survive, at least, uh, we need to um, uh, ensure that um, uh, we have the necessary education um, and um, um, I think that's the most important thing and, and maybe we, we need to be creative because uh, with every technological advance um, the way people work change so for example when machines they replace manual tools uh, a lot of works they change and nowadays when artificial intelligence comes into play uh, maybe more manual jobs will be replaced and people have to move to like more creative jobs i think that's the that's the trend yeah yeah, yeah. but as i said 
I don't necessarily agree with this trend because uh, the way uh, life should be is very debatable from the philosophical mm. point of view. Mm. Yeah. Why do you not think we're in a wisdom race? Um, well, I think we are, but we are maybe passively because uh, after like because we exist in this society and it's moving technologically and we have to we have to participate in the race right but this is not necessarily what like people subconsciously are willing to uh, for example a lot of technologies are created to make your life easier but in fact everyone feels that the life is becoming more and more difficult because you have to acquire more knowledge in order to adapt to the new ways of living versus maybe some of the more primordial ways of living which are still somewhat present in some of the less developed places on the planet where that's you're, right. where you're just kind of like just chilling during the day yeah, yeah. you get some water get some food yeah and then thing. you just chill yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so it's debatable whether or not uh being pushed into the economic machinery of cities is actually a higher quality or a higher standard of happiness and uh, flourishing. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. That's what you mean. Yeah. Oh my gosh, yeah. that's I, that, a really that's a <laughs> maybe big that's one. different from a lot of people. That's a belief. big one to unpack. I think the statistics are uh, somewhere in the ballpark of up maybe eight to eight out of every ten people are living within. Uh, 60 or so miles of a 100 kilometers or so of a coast yeah and those are mostly cities big cities yeah over 50 percent of people living in big metropolises yeah. with economic machinery that's buzzing every single day yeah that, and people are hectic every day yeah the yeah. the the email boxes and the and the text boxes yeah, and the WeChat and the WeChats and, the, yeah. and the, they're, they're all filled and you got to reply and your tasks switch all the time and yeah and you have to earn the money so that you can pay for the rent and pay for the food yeah yeah and uh, yeah, this is the way we live right now right yeah we may we may need to um, Okay, we'll full circle back to this exact um, topic at the end. Let's get into the journey. Yep. Who were you growing up and how did you get interested in computer science? Right. So um, I got interested in computer science because um, I had a chance to like play with the computers when I was a kid. And at that time I thought, okay, computers are intelligent because I can play games and the computers can tell me like... Um, six plus five is 11 right so um, that makes me feel very interested in learning algorithms so as I grew up I started to learn the mathematics and um, uh, data structure etc that um, are behind computer science and I start to be able to hack some of the games uh, and I become like more and more attached to computer science and I chose that as a major when I went to college yes. so I continue this line of uh, work Cool, cool. I'll, those are always um, really powerful moments when you, first of all, computers are just like a massive uh, hack for humans uh, to process information. And uh, I mean, like, wow, what a crazy advancement computers have been in the last century. Okay, and then it's always really powerful when then you are able to um, adjust a variable in the it's a simple like computer game that is then literally immediately has an effect on yeah. the game. Yeah. And you're like, ooh, ooh. Exactly. For example, you can lock a part of the memory and figure out where is your health point and you can lock that part of the memory <laughs> <laughs> and you can play on forever. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And not take damage. <laughs> Things like that. Or you can like lock your money to be infinite and yeah, then just yeah. buy whatever you want. Yeah, 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 in a strategy game, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. yeah this. Okay, and that was at Tsinghua University, mm -hmm. where that was the, um, the undergraduate for computer science. And then you made this big leap to Oxford mm -hmm. for your master's and for your PhD. Yep. And let's talk about what it was like first to get into um, statistical machine 
translation. This is from Chinese to English, mm -hmm. but also the immersion into the United Kingdom. All right, and mm -hmm. into just English culture mm -hmm. versus Chinese culture. What was that yeah. like? Uh, the cultural difference, because I went from China to the UK in two thousand five. Uh, 2005. Um, at that time, the difference between China and the UK was uh, relatively large, I believe, because China was relatively less developed. So I went to the UK, I felt everything was expensive at that time. And my English was not that good as well. And people, my classmates call my English Jinglish because I was from Beijing. And I used to say er, er all the time. And some of them say this is pirate English. Yeah, like this. Um, but the sort of I got adapted to the to the English uh, environment, and uh, it's like my broken Chinese is so <laughs> bad right now. People can't understand me at all. Even the machines that I try to translate to can't understand my Chinese. It's so bad. Well, I just yeah. uh, the, uh, when we were in a free chat, I just uh, the, the, the mentioned four characters, and th I think you can speak that well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, at least I can understand it. But anyway, so in terms of education, so one of the sharp differences I found was that um, in Oxford, when I took a course and when I submit my exercises, and every time I got a correct mark, a tick. But this was very different from Tsinghua because in Tsinghua and uh, when I was in a high school, so every time I submit something, it's, I very easily get a cross, so which is incorrect. So uh, I felt that the education was very encouraging. So um, there are no very strict... From a simple difference like having an X for an incorrect yeah. versus having a check mark for a correct. Right. You saw a greater amount of like encouragement from a process that was like kind of like rewarding the proper answers. I believe, uh, at least I felt that I felt that the marking was very encouraging because there are a lot of ways you can understand and you can answer a question. And uh, most of the time I got a correct mark and I was encouraged and I gained a lot of confidence in my learning. Actually, when I was in Oxford, I chose seven courses and I got an A plus for all of them. Wow. And that was a, later on, the people say that was remarkable in Oxford because nobody seemed to have done that. Wow. But a twist in the story. And later, when I became a teaching assistant, I realized, oh, it's not so difficult to give correct marks to every question. It's actually easier to give correct marks to every question than to find out a particular error from the student marking sheet. So I think part of oh. the encouraging marking scheme may result from the reluctance from the TA to spend too much time on student marking. Whoa. I mean, <laughs> that's, that's ironic, right? Yeah, so then yeah. what formula is actually optimal for education then for marking and for or helping with the closed loop feedback for a student to learn? I mean, uh, to my personally, I believe that uh, a more encouraging way uh, you mark the answer sheet is necessary. Uh, but uh, right. I mean, maybe the, the, the Chinese system, the teaching assistants were more serious than in the UK system. And then what about the immersion into statistical machine translation from Chinese to English? Mm -hmm. Teach us about how you got interested in that and what those first days were like. Right, right. So um, I chose natural language processing uh, also because I'm so interested in machine intelligence. Because uh, at the time I were to choose a supervisor in Oxford, uh, there were quite a few alternatives. And some, like professors, they also worked on uh, software engineering and other topics. So, but um, after I took the course and I learned about natural language processing, I thought this is really interesting. And uh, like um, just a few months after I developed my first system that can parse Chinese, I was so proud because I saw in the monitor that my system can intelligently analyze the structure of Chinese sentences, I thought this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Again, so I went into this field until now. So at the time I started working on natural language processing, it's not a very popular field. So when I mention the word NLP, people will not know it. People will feel, okay, this might be some like a psychology therapy or something. Uh, it's very different from nowadays. 
There's also the neuro-linguistic programming, which is another tactic that uh, people use in um, like motivation or in actualization or in persuasion or all this type of stuff. So this is the other NLP, which is natural language processing. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then it's also very interesting thinking about when you first figure out how to parse a sentence. I mean, the, the whole idea that we found a way to vibrate our vocal cords to create meaning for another creature to understand and then share knowledge through that process and then figure out words which then make it easier. Words are like a compression algorithm for communicating in the reality that we're in. And so then now you're like, okay, well, let's label the natural language that we've created and let's parse it for meaning for okay so you have to parse it for both syntax and semantics so meaning is semantics and syntax is the order of nouns and verbs mm, the structure of structure. The, like the sentence yeah so you have to do that for chinese which is like way different than english all right so uh, the underlying technology are similar because when i started to do research um, people have created those uh, linguistically annotated corpus, like the corpora. Um, the expert will basically manually mark uh, what are the sentence structures for both English and Chinese. And then uh, what's left of the algorithm to do is to learn from those manual labels uh, the regularities or the patterns or the statistics. And after they learn from human annotation, they can try to mimic human annotation when they, like, when a new test sentence is um, is given. So the the algorithm will basically just uh, use statistical information to do the prediction of unseen cases, and that helps me to um, uh, use similar algorithms to deal with English and Chinese, and I don't have to be a a deep linguistic expert to be able to develop those algorithms and that's a good thing uh, but for Chinese language processing there are also uh, unique problems to solve for example uh, word segmentation um, because Chinese sentences are written as continuous sequences of characters without word delimiters this is quite unlike English so unique problems whether you can segment a sentence into words uh, before more like a uh, natural language processing tasks can be performed. Would that be that English has words like the, of, and, to? Yes. And Chinese? Uh, Chinese has function words as well, but like every word is written continuously. Just imagine you have an English sentence with, uh, without spaces. It, uh, uh, Chinese sentences are written like that. Uh, damn. Without spaces until yeah. the period. Until the period, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Whew. Interesting. Already such a fascinating difference between the two languages. Okay. So then that would be like us having to figure out where the word ends and where the next word starts. Mm -hmm. So then it could be that three characters equal a word yeah. or only two of the characters equal a word. That's correct, yeah. Oh my gosh. Or just one character is the word and mm -hmm. the next character is always the beginning of the new word. Yeah. Or maybe 10 characters could be a very long word, but that's rare. What's the longest uh, word? In um, so the longest word in some of the corpora are between 10 and 20 characters. And those are idioms, I think. Oh. Yeah, or transliterated uh, terms. There are long names. Uh, after transliteration, it becomes a lot of characters. Whoa. Yeah. Okay, so... Let's come to this, uh, to this 
this, un, this, this, this parsing uh, analysis. So we, um, we have something like a, a, uh, a, a need to understand both the syntax and the semantics. So how does that work? Like, l okay, let's start with this. Is this a reinforcement machine learning process? Um, no, so uh, for parsing, so if you have uh, manual labels for every constituent in a, a constituent tree or for every dependency relation in a dependency tree, then you could have supervision signal over every decision. So you don't have to do reinforcement learning. But uh, like uh, your question is also interesting because there have been uh, attempts to learn the syntactic structure from unlabeled data. And when that happens, uh, techniques such as reinforcement learning can be useful. Yeah. At one point, the data was unlabeled and then we labeled the data to train Yes, a machine. A machine. And then that's reinforcement. Uh, no, that's not reinforced. That's, that's when, supervised learning. That's supervised. Yeah. Okay. So us labeling unstructured data is supervised. Yeah. Machine learning. Yeah. And the reinforcement machine learning is when we label the data, the machine learns, and then it gives us another um, understanding and then we keep correcting it or how yeah right reinforcement learning is more like learn by exploration so it's like you ask the algorithm to explore the possible structures by itself but at certain stage uh, you give it a award the award function to tell it whether you are like labeling is correct and this kind of award function might be external for example uh, you make the machine parse a sentence by itself and then ask, ask it to make some decisions such as predicting the sentiment of a sentence based on your parse tree. So, and then the sentiment is human labeled. So you give the like parsing algorithm an external reward so that the parsing algorithm will come back and figure out, okay, maybe this is not the correct syntax. So it has to change the syntax. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Supervised machine learning is labeling unstructured data feeding that into the machine. And reinforcement learning is then assigning a reward function for the machine to go towards so that if it does succeed at picking um, with a certain amount of confidence that this, is, this was the noun or this was um, the, 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 the most uh, correct, um, what we took from the audio form and picked a word that you reward it for, and then it learns that, okay, that was the word chair in that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh -huh. Sort of, yeah. Sort of. Mm -hmm. You know, this is all really, really complicated. <laughs> That's too, it's too uh, technical to the specific field. It's very, very technical, especially when there's differences between Chinese and English. I think that's so interesting. Um, let's briefly mention along the way as well, um, you built ZPAR, mm -hmm. so Statistical Multilanguage Parser for English and Chinese. So when was that built and how did that come up for you? And right. how is it being used? Yeah. Right. So ZPAR was a project that I started off uh, when I was a student in Oxford. So basically I was trying to work on uh, parsing uh, for the languages. And I was um, not so satisfied with existing libraries, so I decided to develop my own parsing library. So uh, my initial thought is that I want to optimize every bit in my software so that it runs fast, it takes the least memory, and it's my own framework so that I can develop novel algorithms on that. It all started with that. And I remember the first version of Zepar started off with my first paper on parsing. And later, as I went to Cambridge to do my postdoc research, and after I went to Singapore to do my, like, um, um, to be a faculty, I continued my development of Zepar along the way. Yeah. So that was a, 
uh, an ongoing project. Yeah. And having been used by so many people now around the world, it's cool seeing something that you make that makes a really significant push for an entire field to understand NLP better. Um, I think um, uh, one uniqueness about that part is its optimization. And because it runs fast, it draw attention from uh, like a lot of people. This kind of optimization are not only from my software engineering optimization, but also from the underlying algorithms. Um, because at the time uh, I was doing the research, people work on parsing, uh, they carefully design some like dynamic programming algorithms to make sure that um, uh, uh, the search algorithm can find a high scored parse tree that a model can find. And that causes a problem, which is a trade-off between efficiency and accuracy. Because the more sources of information you want to use for your parser, uh, the slower your parser will run uh, due to the use of dynamic program. And instead, I try to develop an algorithm uh, called transition-based algorithm. So it allows us to use whatever sources of information we need uh, with linear runtime complexity. And the sacrifice is that the search algorithm, in, 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 in search algorithm, the inference algorithm, is not optimal. And I try to solve the problem by designing machine learning algorithms to guide search algorithm so that the, the algorithm can run both fast and accurate. I think that was the, the success of ZEPAR. Um, now, uh, the whole field has transitioned from a, a, a statistical um, machine learning driven field into a deep neural network learning driven field. Mm -hmm. And at this time, uh, transition based parsers have become maybe less popular, relatively less popular as it was maybe six years ago but I still continuously work on transition-based parser. And in this year, in a top conference, uh, there was one paper from Berkeley confirming that a recent parser um, of our research group, when combined with large-scale pre-trained language model, mm. still works the best, like in the benchmarks. Whoa. So that's a continuation of, uh, of this line of work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speed and accuracy are the big ones. Yeah. And yeah the, we, when we speak uh, into um, voice to text, we care a lot about speed and accuracy. Yeah, Some yeah, big ones. Yeah, especially when uh, you think about the industry and people worry about uh, uh, the speed of their systems because they have so many requests from users. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. And then you mentioned that you went on to this assistant professorship at Singapore University of Technology and Design. Mm -hmm. And that was for six years. So teach us about that period of time and what it was like being a professor, starting to teach young people. Right. So um, the thing about professor is that you take more responsibility in organizing a research group. Mm -hmm. And you also uh, do teaching. For the teaching part, I, I love teaching. And part of the reason I want to be a faculty is because I can um, teach. I can organize uh, whatever the research field has achieved into teaching materials and I can impart that to students so that they are equipped with the necessary toolkit. So I like the, the teaching part and I like writing textbooks as well. So this is one part. And in terms of research, uh, being a faculty is very different from being a like postdoc because you have to run a research lab. You have to think about how you can find research funding to support the postdocs, to, su to support the PhD students. So you have to turn um, uh, you have to devote a lot of time writing research grant proposals to try to get money. And then uh, you have to work with your students. So uh, when I started off of, as a faculty, I don't have a lot of students, so I still spend um, a significant proportion of the time working alone, like as if uh, as a postdoc. Uh, but as I get more and more students, I have to spend time working with the students. So that's a transition. And I spend time um, uh, teaching the student how to do research and uh, like uh, giving my research ideas to them to execute and helping them write research papers and I think that's a difference but uh, as I see so many students graduate from my team and including my research assistants they go to like top universities in the world 
having full PhD scholarship, and I feel very good. So wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. What an important responsibility to take on professing and running a research and running um, helping teach other students and making them really successful that's a great yeah. responsibility to take on and then what about the transition to Westlake right this happened a year ago uh, that happened a year ago but that uh, was um the initiative to move back to China started more than a year ago because my family decided to move so uh, my move to China was uh, completely a personal reason and um, it, it, it concerns about like uh, 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 the the choice of my whole family, including my wife, my kid, and also about the education of my kid, and also about like the uh, to be closer to parents, etc. Mm -hmm. And when I started to look, um, I searched for different universities, and then uh, Westlake came into my sight when I like uh, look for research universities. Uh, and uh, luckily, uh, when I contacted Westlake, I was invited for an interview, like just within a day, right? Mm -hmm. and, then, and I came here and I realized, oh, the atmosphere is really exciting. So I stopped looking further and decided, okay, I will come. Yeah. And after I signed the contract, I signed the contract in 2017, actually. But uh, I thought I need to finish. Uh, my research project in Singapore and I have to uh, see that my, most of my graduate students they graduate so I took a transition period and uh, formally moved back in uh, uh, 2018 yeah, yeah yeah and now being here you guys have a lot of people already like NLP is a very hot subject so you guys have two postdocs seven research assistants eight PhD students six to ten visiting research students so you're like 20 to 30 people, you said you were packed over the summer with lots of people visiting. So what is everyone working on? Fundamental NLP is this mm -hmm. main overarching subject. Yes. yes, so the goal of my uh, research team, I mean, is to uh, push forward fundamental NLP technologies. Um, and so most of the students, they work on fundamental NLP problems, such as parsing and also information extraction problems. So what is information extraction? It, it is, um, uh, in short, is to extract structured information from unstructured text. So for example, you want to uh, extract out what entities are mentioned in a text, and what are the relations between these entities, such as a person can work for an organization, um, an organization can be located in a location, etc. And you want to extract event, for example, like um, the CEO of a company has changed. Uh, and you also want to extract sentiment from text, such as uh, the, these people are positive about this company or these people are complaining about that product. Mm. So this information are highly useful for uh, further applications, such as stock market prediction, etc. So the goal of my research is mostly uh, focused on how can we fundamentally solve the NLP problem to make algorithms intelligent in understanding human languages, in generating human languages across domains. And this is currently still an unsolved problem. So we're devoting a lot of research attention to those problems. Okay, so we have within fundamental NLP a, an ability to parse language in general and okay so there's a couple things i think maybe one of let's start let's start off this way and then <clears throat> after we let's start off this way and then we'll see where we go from here so a very classical example is maybe text in terms of like maybe books or articles or that type of stuff sentences posts onto social platforms all this type of stuff and so you would want to then have within a book, let's say like Harry Potter, you would want to know, okay, well, this, you have to identify that this Harry Potter is a character mm -hmm. first in the book. Yeah. So you have to know that they're a noun first. Yeah. They are and named entities, for example. A named entity. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then you have to identify the other named entities. Like, how do you train a parser 
to find named entities mm -hmm. and how do you make a, a knowledge graph right. of how the named entities have relationships with each other and also like their sentiment, like if they're happy or sad or if they're located in a specific area, how do you start doing that? Yeah, so uh, you're given one example, which is like uh, uh, the analysis of novels. So this is something we're very interested in. This is a, I should call a very fundamental research problem because it doesn't have an immediate downstream application. Um, so we work on this sort of things for many, many years. Um, novels are a relatively um, uh, a, a, a low resource domain in the sense that there are not a lot of human labels in this domain. So to correctly extract named entities and relations from novels is a, a domain adaptation problem or a few shot learning problem because you don't have training examples. What we could do is uh, we could train a model from the news domain where uh, there are human annotations on the entities and their relations and we try to adapt that kind of machine learning model to a, to a novel. So this is called a domain adaptation problem. So we can use domain adaptation technology to solve the problem. Or alternatively, uh, a novel is a relatively fixed world because the character names, they from the beginning to the end, they're relatively stable. So we can use statistical technology to extract like what are so stably occurring across the whole novel. And we can sort of get an idea uh, which are likely uh, personal names, etc. So th that's completely unsupervised. That's another technology. Um, what's more fundamental? We're trying to train algorithms that can learn and that can generalize from a more uh, a cognitive point of view. Because we humans, uh, when we humans learn, we learn a few examples from the textbook and we can generalize. We are very good at summarizing the key concepts and generalizing. But so far, the machine learning algorithms, they cannot do it. They're data hungry. They must be trained end to end so they basically they recite the patterns from the training data and they try to mechanically uh, perform prediction over new data. So we try to do some more cognitive driven approach to enable uh, machine learning algorithms to, to be more adaptive and more robust across different uh, text genres. Yeah, there are a lot of research questions uh, from this uh, novel analysis. I love this one. Novel analysis is really interesting. And you were actually teaching me about the this like kind of like this bigger uh, push for um, China internet novels, mm -hmm. which I was very interesting. Most people in the United States aren't so familiar with that. I mean, the United States is very much so about like buying a hard copy book or or uh, getting an audible, an audio copy of the book, or even yep. a digital copy on the Kindle or whatever. Yep. But this push for like internet novels in China is really interesting in how you guys can advance your NLP parsers on the yep. big internet corpus of, of, and people are like releasing chapters, and people are kind of like waking up and like waiting for the specific chapter to be released. It's yeah, kinda, yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, so the, like the Chinese novel market is a little bit different, on, I mean, including the music market. So uh, uh, for Chinese uh, novel writers, uh, a lot of them go to internet, uh, uh, the internet publishers. They're not so-called so publishers, they're actually websites where you can just uh, upload your novels day by day uh, without getting paid. And then all these free internet novels are accessed by readers across the country as well. So, and um, how it works is that uh, when a lot of people pay attention to one novel, uh, the click, the clicks will increase and the website will pay the author by the number of clicks uh, in the end. Yeah. And this is how the market runs in the Chinese uh, internet novels. And because of this, um, there are a lot of writers who maybe the publishers won't even pay attention to because their writing is so big to the uh, so bad to the editor, but they, their novels go online and they attract a reader attention and they improve their writing in the <laughs> end. <laughs> so this kind of uh, 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 the way it works is uh, I think it's quite unique in China. And recently, the Chinese internet novels has caught 
attention from abroad as well. So for example, in Southeast Asia and in North America, people started to pick up like the, 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 the Chinese internet novels, which talks about <coughs> maybe uh, um, an artificial world, such as the fairy world, or the world of China, China martial art, yeah. or the world of business, the world of military people, like imagine a lot of new worlds from there. So, um, so that um, people wake up and wait for the new release of the next episode, etc. Yeah. So, uh, uh, luckily, we recently got in collaboration with some like a a, 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 a startup company who tried to do machine translation of Chinese novels to English, and wow. so our upstream work on the novel analysis now got funded into some like uh, uh, more systematic research. Yeah. yeah. I like how you're teaching me about this that sometimes um, research is actually really cool because you do research for the sake of research and not necessarily for the sake of getting some sort of a reward from the market. Mm -hmm. And then what's cool is that that you can end up getting a really great partnership down the line when so, maybe some of the market catches up to where your research is at. Yeah. And then they'll be like, okay, hey, like we're finally ready to use some of this great research that you've done. Can we pay, you know, can we collaborate? Can we you know, work together on this? That's, yeah. that's great. Yeah, I have another story, which is about my work on like a stock market prediction. And that started off in 2013 when I uh, was, uh, when I just became an assistant professor. So I invited, so, so basically that line of research caught a lot of attention recently because more and more people started to think about applying uh, cutting, the air, cutting edge NLP technologies to stock market prediction. But when I started working on that, um, people in the uh, financial research literature were still very uh, crude on how to use NLP technology. So basically a lot of uh, uh, their papers were about counting words. You just count the number of negative words and uh, you make market predictions. But uh, because we could uh, parse a sentence into structures, we can get structured events from news. So we could predict the market better. But what drove me to work on that, um, there are a lot of factors. One of the factors was interesting, I can tell you a story. I invited a colleague from Spain to give a talk in Singapore. And he talked about parsing. And after his excellent talk, uh, one of my colleagues stu uh, stood up and asked the question, what is this useful for? So because this is really upstream. So I was a little bit embarrassed. I thought, okay, I don't know uh, my invited speaker, how, how can he answer the question? But he was really calm, <coughs> saying, look, this could be used for stock prediction because you can know the events, etc., etc." And then, uh, so that was part of the thing, say, why don't we just start off doing it? And we started off doing some research on that. But we did, when, when we did that, we were basically trying to find a very interesting application to parsing. Uh, but we didn't think about whether it can make a lot of money or not at yeah. that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, is then a decent amount of what's happening with stock market prediction based on sentiment? analysis? Uh, yes, there are a lot of people working on that. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, but we were also very interested in like the news, right? Because the news talks about events and events are happening around us every day. So what are the correlations between the events and the market? It's a very fundamental question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like uh, if there's a certain amount of an issue happening with like a crop in a region yeah. and then that news can be directly that quickly parsed and then um, and then given to uh, people that are trading that commodity exactly yeah, exactly stuff like that exactly so uh, so when I uh, collaborated uh, more and more with like uh, traders and people in that field I realized that uh, information um, um, uh, the asymmetry uh, between the buyers and the sellers in the uh, uh, in the in the in the capital market uh, is a very big issue actually, uh, especially in developing financial markets such as China. Like uh, information are not not quickly conveyed between different parties, different players in the field. So in this aspect, natural language processing can facilitate 
can like can can facilitate the development of the capital market in the, in this uh, in this um, uh, um, developing market. Yeah. And then let's get to um, other examples. We have this great example of of parsing novels, and you can parse also like social media for sentiment as well, mm-hmm. and for news. We were just talking about you can parse. Um, reports and all different other kind of like articles, etc. Okay. Then there's this whole other beast, which is audio. Mm-hmm. Audio is, is in a sense like, you know, you're not what one. We're, you're you're using like optical character recognition for text mm-hmm. for when it's text mm-hmm. written text. Mm-hmm. Like okay, that's the word water. This is the word plant. Mm-hmm. Like you can tell those are yeah. different, uniquely different. But like water and how that you know comes out into an actual wave that is then processed, and you have to do like a, a you have to do like a digital signal processing every yeah. single time yeah. of what that is. Plant. Mm-hmm. So, how are you guys involved in audio? Uh, not really. We okay. are more based on uh, uh, we, we work on text, but like audio is very relevant to natural language processing. So yeah. there's a field um, uh, called uh, speech recognition, and there's a field called text to speech. I guess those fields are 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 necessary uh, before you can do natural language understanding of audio. And over the years, deep learning has allowed those fields to develop also very quickly. For example, text-to-speech technology has um, developed a lot, and the people can mimic uh, real people voice to the extent that uh, it can um, people can hardly distinguish whether this is synthesized on audio or this is on the human audio. Yeah, the issues yeah. with the deep fakes. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. Interesting that you guys are not as focused on that. This is one of the tough things about actually being a principal investigator is that you have to figure out where to invest your life energy and mm-hmm. your mm-hmm. resources, your time, the yeah. inspiring the other researchers. Yeah. yeah. The more you work on a fi- you know uh, like in a field, the more you feel really the the energy um, the, the the time of a person of a researcher is really really limited. And as long as you can bring breakthrough in a small, small field, that's already a, a quite big achievement, right? So I remember a lot of uh, 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 scientists also uh, talk to me about it, say that the energy of a person, the lifespan of a person is really limited and then it, yeah. develop, it devotes to one small thing. Yeah. Yeah. So then let's do um, a dive into... Um, what exactly it looks like to be building out like a, uh, a, a catalog or a corpus of, of your NLP technologies and what that is like, you know, in comparison to some of the other big giants like, you know, Baidu and Google and all these companies have also their own NLP. They have their own fundamental NLP they're working on like yeah, they have to work on like these KPIs, the key performance indicators, and like, oh, they have to like do sometimes do things that are going to make money and get rewarded by the market and mm-hmm. focus on that. But sometimes they can also do research. Yep. And so what differentiates what you care about versus what the other big corporations are doing with fundamental NLP? Yeah, yeah. I think now the differentiation can be rather small because as you mentioned, a lot of companies that give uh, freedom uh, to their researchers on exploring uh, whatever they like. But I feel that uh, in the academia, um, uh, we get more freedom in exploring uh, what's interesting. For example, novel analysis, it might not directly apply to Baidu or Google, um, but uh, like uh, we could just spend a lot of time working on it. Um, uh, so um, so this, this could be one difference. And in here, we also got uh, a chance to collaborate with like a neuroscientist, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there are people working on like fly, the fruit fly brains. There are people working on mice brains. 
Uh, there were also people working on like human brains. They uh, we got a, a like a colleague working on like a, a brain computer interfaces. Uh, uh, talking to those people provide us a, a lot of chances to. Um, to, to study like natural language understanding from a cognitive point of view, which I think is also a unique um, uh, thing about academic research. Mm, yeah, so you guys have that multidisciplinary community here where you can work with like Mohammed Sawan or yeah, with uh, yeah. Yisun and you guys can... Yes, exactly. Think, yeah, yeah. Those are exactly the people I talk to, yeah. Yeah, we yeah. love them as well. Those yeah. are some of our favorites. Yeah, yeah. yeah. E is, a, is, yeah. A, is a definitely an expert in uh, visualizing all the neurons and all the connection in the fruit fly brain. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Actually, the work has a lot to do with um, the neural mechanisms of social cognition and so uh, in many ways, NLP is about social cognition, and so it's very yeah. interesting that you know one writer can write um, a, a chapter, and then it can be viewed by millions of people. Exactly, and, yeah. exactly. The more I work on this, the field, the deeper I get understand the field. Because uh, the first time you work on uh, syntax, for example, you see syntax as abstract trees. But uh, uh, the more you work on it, you realize, okay, syntax is not detached from semantics. Sometimes you understand the meaning before you understand the structure. Interesting. And the more you work on it, the more you realize, no, syntax is not detached from cognition as well. Sometimes you really need common sense or you need external knowledge or world knowledge in order to understand the syntax. So uh, wow. the more you work on it, the more you feel, okay, so this is... Um, Everything is correlated and it's correlated from a fundamental understanding. Teach us about how we have like a relatable example with uh, when I can understand the meaning before I can understand the syntax. All right, so um, let me give an example on coreference. So coreference means uh, in a sentence you have a lot of different pronouns and nouns mentioning, talking about the same real world entity, but you don't know which are connected with each other. So I have an example, uh, say, the dog cannot cross the street because it was two, and I can have another world, uh, I, I can have another word in, to finish the sentence, right? And here, uh, there's one entity, the dog, there's one entity, the street, there's one like a uh, pronoun, it. And when I say, the last word is timid, mm -hmm. then it refers to the dog. Right? But when I say the last word is wide or busy, busy, um. it refers to the road. And if I say the last word is dark, then uh. it refers to the environment. Oh, right. which even then was, there was no, the environment was a very abstract, it didn't even have its own word. Exactly, in so sentence. it's in, implicit all right, mention. Whoa. Yeah. So, so you see, uh, uh, when you try to resolve the coreference or you try to resolve the anaphora, you have to really understand the meaning or you, could, you should also have a world knowledge about the scenario of crossing a road. Whoa, so you, how would you ever teach fundamental NLP to have implicit understanding that this is happening in an environment. Yes, so this is part of the things we're currently working on. We're trying to uh, like uh, evaluate how, how the current models are equipped with common sense knowledge and how to impart common sense knowledge into NLP models. So that's one of the directions our team members are working on. How the heck do you impart common sense knowledge? I think there are, there, are, there are a lot of different technologies. For example, uh, you can directly apply explicit knowledge graphs to a natural language understanding system. Or you can train a system over a large amount of unannotated, unlabeled text and help to guide it, like collect common sense knowledge from those texts. Just as uh, we collect common sense knowledge from uh, textbooks but uh, another interesting thing is to connect common sense knowledge with cognition because as you mentioned some researchers are working on how we perceive the world so we have an inbuilt ability to understand the three-dimensional space and time so this is what existing NLP systems are not quite focused on this was a really good interview with Gary Marcus we just did on rebooting AI that you can 
start building uh, uh, computers that can perceive with space time and causality and what would it be like if an NLP system found itself in a, a space time and causality yes yes existence yes uh, they must exist in a cognition system and it must uh, have a presentation in speech for example I say this person is really big where we're using space ideas to convey an abstract concept uh -huh. and this is prevalent in languages whoa yeah so yeah. Uh, language perception is quite correlated with our space and time perception and causality is another thing uh, in natural language understanding so there's a task in information extraction called causality extraction okay yeah and it also plays an important role give us the example with causality extraction a uh, one example is for example uh, one famous ceo steps down a company and the stock price falls down so uh, the text might not explicitly mention that there's a correlation, causality correlation, uh -huh. but you want to extract this fact in order to help you better trade in the market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What do these, uh, these trees look like? Like, do you, like how many different uh, NLP uh, systems do you have? Uh, that you can just like do you just pick an nlp system for a specific problem that you want to solve and then you deploy that one uh, do these all kind of work together and they're deployed at the specific need that they that you that you need and what do their like trees of like programming data that like their algorithms what do those trees look like that's a very good question. I appreciate uh, your line of thought here. So um, um, currently every NLP task is solved alone. So it's like you have some training data, you can train an algorithm to learn from the data and the algorithm can perform this task. And it's called end-to-end -end learning, input in, output out, right? So uh, like five years ago, I was an uh, advocator for end-to-end -end learning as well because I think this is really great. It saves us from feature engineering. It saves us from a lot of effort to develop how to solve a particular task. We just care about the input and output. And the deep learning algorithm can remember, okay, the correlation, can discover the correlation. But now you think, think about it. Every, tasks, every task require a set of labeled data to train on, right? And there are tens and hundreds of tasks that a person can need. So this is definitely not um, the ultimate way an ideal NLP system should, should work, right? So think about human cognition again. We learn syntax, mm -hmm. and we learn spelling, and we learn semantics. And in the end, every knowledge came into our system, and we can perform even better tasks by th synthesizing all these existing tasks together. And, um, I'm personally very interested in joint modeling as well. So from the very beginning, I do research. I work on, for example, joint word segmentation and part of speech tagging, because I believe knowledge from these two tasks can uh, be mutually beneficial and can help a model to better uh, perform both tasks. And now I still hold this point of view, but from a deeper understanding. So I believe that if people can do natural language understanding and all the related tasks from a more cognitive uh, driven way, and maybe one model can learn all these tasks. Yes. Yes. And now end-to-end -end systems cannot do it because information from one task may become noise for another task. Yes. Yes. If we can mimic human understanding, we can automatically figure out which sources of information are correlated and which sources of information are conflicting with each other. So that's a, that will be, that will make the algorithm truly intelligent. Like right now, I'm not really using my, my like somatosensory system or my olfactory systems. I'm not really using um, my touch and my smell that much right now. I'm mm -hmm. really just using visual um, and I'm using language centers right mm -hmm, now. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, that, if when you have your NLP system that's able to have 
everything that you've ever made potentially embedded within it. And then once you feed it an input, it recognizes immediately out of, let's say, 47 different systems that it only needs to use two of the 47. It shuts down the 45 so that you don't use any compute on those. And then you only use those two on that problem. And then you output out the approx approximately. Exactly, okay. exactly. And in addition, you can borrow uh, whatever can be borrowed from the other senses to better uh, convey what you can convey in these two senses. For example, you can say, well, the task is so beautiful. Uh, when you describe a task, right, you're, 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 you're using your visual senses to describe something that is elegantly laid out. Yes. And uh, uh, so basically you can better integrate uh, like knowledge from different senses, making them rather than noise, uh, making them like uh, boost the performance of each other. Yes, yes. Oh, I like that a lot. Okay. So what would you say is the most uh, popular uh, NLP algorithm that you guys have developed? Um, there are quite a few because uh, the underlying algorithm of ZPAR, which is a transition based model guided by learning, is adopted by a lot of research. Um, our attempt to use uh, cutting-edge NLP technology on trading is also uh, receiving increasing research attention. Mm -hmm. Another thing that we recently developed is uh, a recurrent neural network structure uh, to represent a graph. Uh, so basically a lot of things in languages are graphs. Um, uh, for example, uh, trees, trees like syntactic trees or coreference links they make a graph out of this text structure. And how do you represent the graph? Uh, it's very important to how you can utilize, uh, make use of the knowledge from this text. So uh, over the past two years or so, uh, we developed some graph representation algorithms called graph, neural net graph recurrent neural networks, which has uh, attracted uh, research attention as well. Um, so all in all, uh, I believe that all these efforts uh, to, 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 to robust natural language understanding um, are, um, are appreciated by some other researchers in the community and uh, we are working together to evolve the field. Yeah. And for people that are maybe wanting to see if they can input in some sort of of their own English text or their own Chinese text and see what what syntax and what semantics that you guys pull from that and then gain some sort of an understanding of how like the knowledge tree may uh, actually be created from you the and well like what what, what would that look like? Would it look like me entering in like a chapter or maybe um, maybe some of the notes that I've written on on a specific topic? And then and then what do you, what do what would what would immediately happen at that point? Would you literally just start, you know, scanning from like top left to right line by line? Mm -hmm. so you'd start scanning and yes. start organizing. Yes. The, like t take us through that. that All right. That so my algorithm will do the left to right scanning. So, uh, uh, but not all the algorithms in the market does that. For example, uh, opposite to transition based algorithms, there are graph based algorithm, which will just read the whole text or whatever you enter as a chunk and start analyzing the chunk like as a whole. But my algorithm will just read it from left to right and incrementally start to build the structure. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, uh, using a lot of state transition actions such as shift and reduce. So uh, I believe that this kind of understanding is closer to uh, psycholinguistic processes yeah, yeah. In, in understanding. Yeah. Okay. So then, you know, the first, um, let's say, let's say the first character is uh, is UA, and then let's say that we label UA with. Uh, a variable, an A or the name, right, right. name A is, yeah, UA. 
and then the next name is Alan, it appears somewhere down the line, and then you, nabl- you, you label that as B, as mm-hmm. like name B, mm-hmm. and then you maybe have a counter on the amount of times that that name has appeared, you maybe start showing a relationship between those names, how often they maybe appear in the book. In sort the, of, yes. Some, sort of things yeah. like this. Like this. And um, the, the latest algorithm we develop contains um, one understanding element and also one look ahead element that can try to project. For example, uh, you've read Yue and Alan, and probably you're expecting a verb or something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so, so we also have this look ahead mechanism. Interesting, a look ahead mechanism. Yeah. I guess that's also. That's really uh, related to neuroscience. Like, into, like humans are always future prediction. I think so. I think so. That's that's inspired by uh, human language processing. I think as soon as I I say a few words, you would have an expectation of what I will say next. Next. Yeah. 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 Where else do you see you and your team mimicking, doing some of the biomimicry for uh, comp- building computer systems? Um, we are trying to go further in the line of transition-based processing. Uh, We are trying to avoid end-to-end systems. We're trying to uh, like mimic uh, how the human brain works in understanding a language. So maybe this part is uh, uh, what we're working on. For example, we're trying to find structures um, in the neural system and we try to make use of those structures to better uh, memorize uh, to better uh, generalize, etc. So that's also why we use graph neural network. We, we work on graph neural networks. So you're starting to immediately make a knowledge graph as I enter in the English or the Chinese writing. Um, uh, yes, in a sense that it's a knowledge graph that's more uh, uh, um, uh, connectionist rather than sim- sim- symbolic. An association. Association, associative right. memory. Yeah. yeah. Sort of. so, you're, so you're starting to build out an associative memory web as you parse the words. Yes, that's an attempt. Because uh, the thing about doing a research is that you always try, but uh, you don't know where you end up to. But our goal is to make some like cognition, cognitive uh, driven uh, NLP models that can really better generate, uh, generalize, that's, uh, that, that, that are more robust across different domains, that are more accurate than the current systems are. So, uh, so the goal ultimately, uh, I, can re- I really want to make an, uh, a natural language understanding and natural language uh, generation systems that can help human beings. For example, my personal assistant can talk to me uh, very freely so that it saves my effort in human computer interfaces and uh, automated driving cars as well right machine translations stock trading systems etc they can read over a lot of uh, news and uh, reports in the market and then and can cleverly trade and also novel reading algorithms for example I can ask it whatever is out there uh, I like this novel a lot. Can you find me a novel that's really similar mm-hmm. to this novel? Or the novel reading system will read a lot of things and tell me whatever I need. That can also boost literature research, computational literature study as well. So if algorithms can intelligently understand languages, then it can help us do a lot of things. This. Making a computer system that is able to do natural language processing that mimics the way that we make associative webs is really interesting. That, if I could have one that's, you know, there is in a sense a little like Alan avatar right now that exists in Google server and like, you know, as soon as I go to, you know, that google.com or baidu.com as soon as you go there it like wakes up and it's like ah what are they about to right, ser- right, right. search for yeah you don't have to search actually you only need to ask questions as soon as you uh, make a query yes. once, you, once you start en- entering 
in yeah. The, yeah. You don't have to enter keywords anymore. Maybe you can just talk to a search engine. Hey, I have this question. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Just yeah. all all by voice and then yeah. by thought. By is, thought is the next and step. Yeah. It will synthesize every piece of information you can get and give you an answer that's tailored to your need. To your exact yeah. need. To yeah. to your entire life history that it's been analyzing, and it knows you. Do you ever worry about the amount of information that Tencent or Baidu or Alibaba or Amazon or Apple or Facebook or blah, 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 that they have on, you were talking about asymmetry earlier. Do you ever like worry about the asymmetry that we don't know ourselves as well as this little like avatar of UA in the cloud knows who you yeah, are and yeah. what you've looked at before. Yeah, that's a profound question. So uh, if you take one step further, you can think about what AI will do to us, right? And especially when you talk about reinforcement learning, so they can explore and learn. And uh, in order to achieve their goal, they can explore different ways to do things. And maybe ultimately AI, when obtaining every uh, bit of information about human beings, uh, they might think about a goal, like uh, what are the correlation between AI and human beings. So, so that's a more profound question. And I think that's also related to the question you asked in the very beginning, is technology the way we should go, right? So in the end, are we seeking our own doom based on technology or are we making our lives really better based on technology? So that's a very profound question. What are your thoughts about that? Um, so I sort of, I, I, in this point about this particular question, I think it's good and bad. So good because, well, uh, it seems that we don't have a choice, right? And we have to move on because this is already, we're so entrenched in this, we cannot move back anymore. So everyone is educated to be more technological, uh, to survive in the society. So uh, we're moving along and we're making a lot of excitement in technology development. But this contradicts with my philosophy, uh, which is we know so little about the world and um, we shouldn't advance so much in, um, in knowledge, maybe in, uh, in, uh, in making our life more complicated. We should make our life simpler. So this is uh, uh, my philosophy. It's also related to uh, Tao. Do you know Tao? Of course. Yes, yeah. I, I believe that uh, it makes a lot of sense. Um, I read uh, like Lao Tzu. Oh, I read yeah. Tao. And I think a lot of things that he says makes sense. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you remember in the very Do beginning... Do you think technology is part of the way? No, not at all. Whoa. The way is against technology. You, you remember in Tao, uh, he uh, claims that you should try not to be too clever. Mm -hmm. Being too clever is not a good thing. And uh, why? Uh, in the very beginning, he says um, um, Tao or the, the real thing, the truth or the wisdom is not tellable. Why is it not tellable? Because what can be told is our whole cognition system. And the reality, the truth, is beyond our cognition system. And I used to talk to mathematicians, and I, uh, I learned that one axiom in math is an equivalence axiom. So which says, if one is equivalent to one, and one is not equivalent to zero. Because I talk in uh, uh, binary terms because I'm a computer scientist. So in uh, Lao Tzu, in Lao Tzu, he says one is yo, half, zero is wu, nothing. One is something, zero is nothing. Uh, and he says the truth cannot be told and uh, because uh, one can be zero. So this completely contradicts our mathematical system. So the, uh, what he claims is that the real truth is not explainable by math. And maybe 
maybe this is sort of uh, coincides with quantum uh, uh, yeah. mechanics because uh, in our math system um, a cannot be equivalent to b cannot be the, the same time equal to b and unequal to b mm -hmm. but in quantum uh, mechanics particles can be at the same time here and there and two particles can be separated uh, like uh, very 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 far from each other but they can be tied with each other so these kind of things are not directly explainable by the like uh, the cognition system and also uh, tend to believe that, uh, as I mentioned to you a bit earlier, math, the whole math system is a simple rediscovery of our cognitive system. It's because we live in this three-dimensional space and uh, time, so we are, we are, we are, we are, we evolve, the, the human, the human uh, beings, we evolve uh, over long, 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 long years to get, like, adapted to this system, to survive in this system. So we uh, rediscover uh, algebra, we rediscover like uh, geometry, like all these kind of things which make sense to us and we create the math system as a summary of our <laughs> reflection of our own cognitive system. But uh, as, as Lao Tzu points out, the Tao is beyond this system. So one can be zero, they can be the same thing. And um, so that's why he, he he claims that we should do as little as possible, which is the opposite to what we are facing right now. We try to do as much as possible, but Lao Tzu says we should do as little as possible. And for me, I want to travel around the world to know the world, to know more, but Lao Tzu said, the more you travel, the less you know. So uh, the real knowledge, you can sit in the sofa, close your eyes, and be quiet and quiet down and meditate, quiet down, and at the stage your thoughts become zero. Yeah. It became infinity and you immediately know everything around you. Yeah. I remember like uh, you also interviewed uh, Professor Cui, like Wei Chen also said, yeah. in Buddhism they also do this. You meditate and you begin to know things beyond your three-dimensional space. Yeah. Right. So this kind of uh, um, practice uh, is is um, what people who practice Taoism they chase after. Mm. But I I think it makes a lot of sense, but I'm very far from that kind of wisdom because I'm also very excited in working on what I'm working on. Likewise, yeah. So then maybe there is some sort of a way to both combine one's ability to dive deep into that zero but also to enjoy the beautiful planets cult uh, cultures and treasures and technologies and mm, I'm not sure this creativities is, and meanings and yes all these things all these things uh, when you feel that this is exciting when you feel that this is elegant, uh, this is far from chaos. But Lao Tzu says chaos is something. Oh, he, he says one paragraph says, uh, Dao, when Tao becomes things, right? When Tao mm. becomes things, uh, it makes things by making chaos. Out of chaos, you start to have shape. And out of chaos, you start to make... Uh, and and uh, this very much coincides with quantum mechanics because when you go to the particle, no shape is there, right? It's sort of uh, chaotic. One of my friends referenced this as uh, crickets trying to understand human civilization. And we are, in a sense, the crickets trying to understand the way. The way. And if the way is chaos, it also coincides with the entropy law. But do you think it's impossible that we understand the way? I don't think I, anything's impossible. I think it's definitely possible because uh, I know people who know more than us, like uh, the, the normal people. Because you, you know those people who practice Tao, yeah. uh, they try to be uh, recluse. They try yes. to get away from the world yes. and they try to hide themselves. Yeah. And um, some of them, 
like also reveal something, right? So, so, so uh, there, I, I definitely know there are people who can know more than I can know. I know that there are people who can do more than I can do. So uh, this kind of things exist, but I don't think you can at the same time be very conscious and at the same time be very chaotic. Uh, as I said, um, mm. I have another story maybe I want to share with you, Please, which is yeah. uh, the entropy law, right? You oh, know yeah. the universe, yeah. if you have a system, um, the system will obey the entropy law because uh, as the time goes, the time, what is time? I don't know, but according to some like a physicist, uh, the time is, is just a one coordinate. But the thing, uh, the uniqueness about the time is that uh, the time flows by uh, obeying the entropy law. Everything will become more and more chaotic. From simplicity evolves complexity. From from no from uh, from order evolves from order to unordered disorder. from dis from order to Which, disorder. In a sense, that could be what simplicity to complexity is. Maybe maybe. I mean, if you assume that the universe is a system then the universe will go to chaos in the end. Then what about intelligence? Intelligence is definitely structure. It is structure. It's not chaos. That's right. So I think intelligence is only uh, something, something like an um, 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 anomaly. anomaly in the development of the whole universe. It's like the universe, if the universe is a river, there can be some uh, swirls in the river and we're just Heading a little bit back. Could it be a purposeful anomaly so that or so that order evolves disorder, simplicity evolves complexity, which is then gives a human brain and a human civilization at some point, which then becomes sophisticated enough to understand the initial source code of the simplicity that it came from and then do a full circle and make the simplicity and start the next cycle again. So there is no linear time, but it's a cyclical time and we're just embedded in the middle. Um, I think that's possible. It's but a fun I, one. Like it's one. a fun one, but I don't know because uh, anything is a possibility to uh, those people who do not know, right? So I don't yeah. know. Yeah. But I, I sort of, I, I tend to think it makes sense that everything will go back to the original point and like do the cyclic thing. I think yeah. it makes a lot of sense to and me. And when you really tap more and more deeply into that feeling, uh, the, in the, com the, at times the political, economic, social machinery around us kind of just fades way and you're just a yeah little, exactly a little, you're more yeah exactly able to be with exactly Tao. if you're really into philosophy then especially if you're really into the philosophy of Taoism then nothing is important right mm. yeah mm. Mm. that's what that's mm. that's what the ultimate truth where the ultimate truth lies. But you keep building better NLP. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I can't, I can't help. I thinking can't help. About, yeah, yeah, I can't yeah. help thinking about the philosophy. Me but too. I can't yeah. help, like working on what I work on. Yeah. Doing and not doing. How to figure out when to do, when to not do. Yeah, it's a it's a very difficult question. I, I think it's a dilemma, right? It is. Yeah. Every time it's a bifurcation of your life trajectory yeah do i do four hours of nlp work right now do i not do do i do play with my child do i do uh, a hike mm -hmm. out to what the actual west lake yeah or you just sit in a room and meditate yeah one of the hardest philosophical hardest questions. hardest question yeah yeah being someone that really understands parsing here we are in this reality 
how do you parse the reality for the most essential things? Uh, I don't quite get your question. So how do you par do you mean how do I understand the um, the reality? Um, how do you identify the essentials? How do you parse for the essentials of reality? Like we like this idea of the way mm -hmm. is such an essential. Right, right. What's essential? So uh, it depends on what you call reality. Uh, I think both the Taoism and, and Tao practitioners and uh, some of the monks, they say whatever you can see and whatever you can hear is not real, right? So those that you cannot see, those you cannot hear in your senses are real. So I remember uh, one of my friends who is also a professor, he mentioned to me what he reads from those uh, books. So uh, when people, the monks, when they record uh, like uh, whatever they hear, they say, oh, uh, this is a plant. But in reality, it's not a plant but I name it a plant in order to be able to communicate with you. So I think those people, they really, I think they have better understanding of the reality, but the reality cannot be told as Lao Tzu says, so because our cognitive system and our communication system are based on like one is one, zero is zero. So if I'm already assigning a symbol, like a word plant to that, yeah. it's not actually that. It's not actually that. Humans just use that word in English, Chinese, Arabic, Hindi, whatever language. Yeah. To describe that. So when I ask you, hey, will you move that plant? Yeah. Or will you water that plant? Yeah. That that's how you, you know, you, you know what I want, would like you to do. But so as soon as we start doing that words and symbols that those are artificial additions to this way and they're actually in a sense further maybe complicating yeah the way and the way is actually in action yeah because what would be an ideal uh nlp tool mm -hmm. maybe 20 or 30 years down the line like give it a good amount of decades down the line what would be this ideal NLP tool that could be the absolute best cutting edge thing that could solve all of the cool visionary things that you want to see happen? Well, I guess uh, it's easy to answer because uh, uh, a real NLP system is an NLP system that can really understand what you say. And um, uh, of course, this is challenging because sometimes what you say requires a lot of background knowledge. But I'm assuming that if an NLP system can really be equipped with the cognitive system that humans are equipped with, at least it can understand the basic science, the basic humanities, uh, the basic background knowledge that um, um, the people have, so that can, it can help people in their like, communication and maybe even do some more exciting things, such as the uh, more analytical things. A 100% yeah. understanding yeah. of yeah. what you are saying and, yeah. and helping be a really good um, catalyst for what your goals are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah. okay. Do you think this is a simulation? I don't know. I have another hypothesis of the world, so which is maybe it's a simulation because our gene structures look like a computer code, right? So only a small fraction of the gene structure is translated into protein in our body. There's still a large proportion which is um, uninterpretable to us. So I don't know whether we are a code and everything is a simulation. <laughs> I'm not sure. What do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? most beautiful thing. Well, I love the nature, I love nature and I love humanities. I think there are a lot of beautiful things in the world which are very in much order. For example, when I 
if, if you look at like uh, art, right? There are so many different cultures in the world, and each culture has its own unique art, and inspires you, like makes you feel excited and appreciate the beauty. And nature is also very beautiful. I like traveling a lot. I go to those ups, I, I go to those like uh, um, uh, wild places, like. Um, uh, in the mountains, in the cliffs, and I appreciate the beauty of the nature as well. So, um, so I believe that beauty is is appreciated by uh, the whole humanity, and we have a common sense of what's beautiful. And uh, maybe what is structural is beautiful. I don't know. Yeah, but it seems that it's so deep rooted in our cognitive system that we all appreciate this beauty and love. Great, thank you so much for coming on to our show. This has been such a pleasure, such thank an you. honor. It's nice talking to you. Thank nice you. Nice talking thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about natural language processing, about fundamental NLP, about parsing for syntax, parsing for semantics, about making more intelligent NLP algorithms, about the meaning of life, about Taoism, about philosophy as well. Have more conversations about all those things. Check out the links in the bio below to UA in the lab. Also reach out if you'd like to get involved and collaborate. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support simulation, our links are below, so we can continue doing cool things like coming on site to great places like Westlake to interview such brilliant minds here. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Bye bye. Peace. Okay. Cheers. Good job, brother. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> <laughs>